This is Work University, episode 50. This is Work University, and I'm Annalisa Felix. This is where I interview people from various employment backgrounds and get the inside scoop on what their job is really like. If you're just getting into the workforce, or if you're curious about getting into something new, listen up. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Sam Leeson. Sam is a birth worker and is here to tell me all about it. Sam, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I am a birth worker. I have worked in this profession for 25 years. I started out really just as a birth doula, attending birth to support individuals and couples on their journey to parenthood after conception through till probably about six weeks postpartum. Through that, I also started childbirth education classes and learning how to be a childbirth educator. So I've taught classes for the last 22 and a half or three years. Um, that also evolved into me becoming a lactation specialist so that I could help people with feeding their babies from their bodies and um, uh, evolved into also adding parenting coach on there decided to throw in some fertility coaching awareness and um, expertise to give me a full package right from the moment someone wants to think about starting or growing their family until after their children. Usually I work with families up until about the time that their kids are about three or four years of age. So quite a spectrum of time. And in the last eight to 10 years, I've really made sure that I focus the overwhelming majority of the work that I do with the 2S LGBTQIA community, because that's my heart. That's the community of which I'm a part. And it's really important to me to make sure that my peers have the support that they need on their journey, because no family is created unintentionally in the 2S LGBTQIA plus community. We have all got stories and experiences to share on our journey. So that's kind of who I am and what I do. Great, thank you. So then the term birth worker is an umbrella for all of those pieces underneath. And um, mm -hmm. what I'm really interested in, and, and all of those are very important in the birth process, even when people are thinking about it. So mm -hmm. you're, you're starting from not only ground zero, you're starting from way way being you know the the thought process so that that is very important what i'd like to focus on right now is the doula piece which is mm -hmm. what does that mean what does that entail and what kind of uh, training do you need to do that and what does that look like take me through that it's in and of itself there's not a lot of formal training that takes place to be a doula um, the first piece is the desire to to be someone who supports someone else through the pregnancy, labor, birth, and immediate postpartum period. That is someone who offers informational, emotional, and physical support through the journey. So someone might reach out to me when they're two weeks post, when they assume they get their period, and we talk about the fact that we're going to work together. And then we have several meetings throughout the pregnancy to keep me apprised of how the pregnancy is unfolding, what kinds of things they've experienced thus far, how they envision the birth unfolding for them. Do they want to have a fully medicated birth? Would they prefer to have a fully unmedicated birth? Are they birthing with an obstetrician in a hospital? Are they birthing with a midwife? And then where I am in Canada, they're registered midwives. So midwives have full privileges inside and outside of hospitals. So do they want a birth at home supported by the care of a midwife? Um, are they doing a, a water birth? What kind of birth do they want to have? How involved do they want me to be to support them physically? Am I there really mostly to nudge their partner along the way so that the partner has an awareness of what they can do to best support their loved one who's giving birth to their baby um, and that kind of thing. And then I stay after the baby's born help make sure that if they're planning to feed the baby from their body, that we can get that initial feeding process started well. And then I visit with them at home a couple of times, one to debrief the birth, and because regardless of how good, bad, otherwise it unfolds, it's going to be a process that's transitioned them from not being a parent to being a parent, or not being a parent of two children to being, I mean, it's always a change in their life. So they need to have an opportunity to talk to somebody about that 
physiologic change that's transpired that also coincides with an emotional change that they're working through. And I, and I like to have time to debrief that with them and talk about what they felt went well and what didn't go well, um, where they also feel like they need help. Um, I've done first baths for I don't know how many babies over the years because parents were a little bit nervous about oh. doing that first bath when they get home. And so could I just do that for them or spot them through it? Um, all kinds of things come up during that process. But really and truly, a birth doula is somebody who's with somebody from whenever in pregnancy. I've been called as late as you know, 39 weeks and three days to, to attend a birth and that particular individual birth on their due date, right, right all the way through. So it doesn't, I mean, people can call me whenever and I join their team and I help them do what I can so that I can ha help them have the birth that they really want to have. There was a lot in your answer and I think you covered it, <laughs> <laughs> which is great because <laughs> now I want to look at the behind the scenes of your job mm -hmm. as your career. Right. What is it that you need to do that maybe I'm not even going to know because I don't know the admin stuff, um, marketing um, certifications? Mm -hmm. So when I first decided I wanted to be a doula, um, I decided to look around because this was 25, more than 25 years ago now that I was looking at what that involved. I found an organization here in Southern Ontario that offered a class, a program I could take. So I registered for that. I went and I actually took my young newborn baby with me um, in the sling so that I could feed as needed and bounce and listen and learn all at the same time. I took that those courses. I did my hours. I had to do a number, attend a number of births as a volunteer that I had to then be assessed both by the person who was birthing, but also by the care team. How was I how did they feel that I worked with them as well as the, as the client that I was working with so that I could get that kind of feedback. And then I had to register with an organization. You get third party insurance once you're registered as a, as a doula. There are, there are governing bodies for doulas and that's mostly just to make sure that we all kind of follow the same general concepts. Some people don't do the registration and they and they function outside of that and they just offer support and they call themselves doulas. Unfortunately, it's not a regulated organization, so it's not something we have to adhere to. So as with any profession out there, there are some really great people who do the job and there are some less than great people who do the job. But all of the people I've met who choose to do it, do it because they deeply believe in helping make sure that people have the kind of birth they want to have. Some people may just go about it in different, ways than I would choose to do. Um, so that's sort of what started. That's how I did it. I did through my um, licensing or my registration through those organizations. And then I added the Lakeshore League and all kinds of other organizations to my credentials as I took more classes over the years. So with that, um, do you have to keep up with an annual certification testing or lessons classes? Not necessarily, although most of us do. So um, unlike a massage therapist or a chiropractor or something who needs to do so many continuing education units every year or every three years to be able to maintain their status, it's not something that a doula needs to do. But most of us, again, who are doing it for the, for the reasons that we're doing it, we do it so that we can, uh, we take the courses so we can stay apprised of what's new, what's exciting, what, what options are available. And what is the trend in the ways of thinking? When I first started, it feels so strange, but when I first started in the industry, the, the choice was not to put a baby immediately skin to skin with their birthing parent after birth. Not very often do we actually see that happen. Most of the time, the cord was clamped and cut and the baby was taken away to the nest, that's newborn evaluation station, that's usually right beside the, the hospital bed if you're birthing in a hospital, baby's assessed, dried off, wrapped up, and given back to the birthing parent. And what we learned, and this was probably 15 to 20 years ago, was the research come out to support that we dramatically reduced the likelihood of a child needing to spend time in a special care nursery or a neonatal intensive care unit if we put that baby immediately skin to skin with the birthing parent. We've done nothing medical, but we know that it stabilizes their body temperature, regulates their heart rate, all of these, it brings their adrenaline levels down, their cortisol levels are low. 
And, and that just helps their overall health. Their oxygen saturation levels are better and everything else is improved simply because we put the baby ultimately where that parent wants that baby to be. Because the moment you've gone through the process and pushed a human out of your body, you just want that human in your arms so that you can love them, guard them, protect them for the rest of their lives. But when they take that baby away, it often makes that parent feel very vulnerable so that increases their own cortisol levels, increases their own anxiety and everything else. So we see an overall picture of a healthy, balanced care when we simply do nothing more than take a baby from a body to a body. That's it. In your experience over these decades, can you just, I'm going to ask you a few different questions here. Give me mm -hmm. off the top of your head, how many births total in a facility and outside of a facility? Uh, so I have attended probably in the neighborhood of about 500 births overall wow, okay. in the last 25 years. So that's a big number to try and break down. For about 12 or 13 of those years, I was teaching in a um, hospital setting. So I was attending six births a month, uh, mm -hmm. at least. And most of those births, I'm going to say probably 90 to 95% of those births were hospital based births. Um, because that's where I was working. So that's where people were coming to me from asking me to be their support person. I was teaching their prenatal class. Could I also be their, their labor support? Um, okay. So then since then, it's probably about a 70-30 split. 70% 70 of my births are still hospital-based births, but 30% are, are in-home. And then at home, are you the person in charge? No, the midwife is the person in charge. Take me so I can picture how this works of somebody giving a home birth, because I've never seen that before. So typically speaking, when there's a home birth situation, and really in any birth situation, as I always ask my clients to call me the minute they think that they're in labor, even if, and, and, that, and not all doulas function this way, I like to be able to plan my life around how things are going to unfold. So I usually take it in three hour chunks. If you think you're in labor, give me a call. And this is when they've seen an established pattern of contractions happening. I talk to them. I find out where I think they are, where they think they are. And I give them some suggestions of coping strategies to help move them forward from where they are. If it's three o'clock in the morning, the only thing I'm going to suggest to them is to try to hydrate and get some sleep as best they can until dawn. That works sometimes. That doesn't work always. <laughs> then when they feel that they need an extra person present, I go to their home and I stay with them until after the baby's born. I usually ask them to wait until they need someone else there with them because one of my philosophies and my core beliefs about labor is to keep life as normal as possible for as long as possible. That helps reduce our stress levels. That helps to keep our anxiety low. So our fight or flight reflex is less engaged and our babies have the ability to move through the pelvis the way they're supposed to and makes our contractions most effective. But once we start getting anxious and worried, now I want people to call me and have me come because now I can do hands-on physical coping strategies, whether I'm using a rolling pin for rolling pressure or tennis balls or using hands-on acupressure or just gentle touch techniques. I help them keep their breathing in a slow rhythmic pattern. I'm not someone who believes in the whole he he ha ha breathing pattern because I've never seen that be effective. It may work well for some. I personally haven't seen it be effective, so I don't employ that. But I do want them to stay relaxed. And when we are our most relaxed, we're breathing slowly and rhythmically. When I see them have a pattern that's consistent and getting closer together so that the contractions are, depending on how quickly they've moved forward, somewhere between seven and four minutes apart, I tell them that they should probably contact their midwife. Then once they've paged their midwife, the midwife will start to do assessments over the phone with them about where they feel the person is in labor. We talk about how fast things have moved forward or how gradually things have moved forward. And they make a plan of care as to when the midwife should come to the house. When the midwife comes, the midwife comes with all of the medical stuff. They bring um, IV fluids, they bring oxygen tanks, they bring a birthing stool, they bring all kinds of stuff. So they come fully equipped to attend a birth. The birthing parent has been instructed in advance to make sure that they have the pads and the towels and 
and the sheets and the things like that that they want. If they're wanting to birth in a birthing tub, then they need to have that set up and that's at their discretion to, to purchase or rent or what have you and get it ready to go. And then the midwife arrives usually when the contractions are consistently four minutes apart, lasting about a minute, and they stay as well until after the baby's born. And when we're just about ready to start pushing, they'll page a second midwife to come to attend so that the two midwives are there. One is a primary care provider for the birthing parent, and the other is a primary care provider for the new baby once the baby's born. Mm, okay. We work together, the baby comes. In your experience, what is the most unusual place you've had to assist giving birth? <sighs> um, I once attended a birth where the bed was wall to wall in the room. And so there was really, and that was a home birth. There was nowhere, we were all on the bed with the parent because there was no other space in the room. It was that, that tight. It was, it was cozy and it was warm. That was a very warm room to have a baby in with two midwives and a partner and the birthing parent and myself. Yeah, it was, it was fun. Um, I've almost caught babies in cars before trying to transport to hospital. Um, but we just, whatever reason, labor shifted and moved quickly. And so, but I've been very lucky to always be in someone's home or in a hospital where I'm supposed to be when, uh, mm -hmm. when those babies have come, I, I don't, I will keep my fingers crossed that it continues to stay that way, but I haven't had any fun, like really bizarre. I've driven, I've driven to the U S from Canada to pick up someone who was in labor and bring them back to Canada so that they could birth with their hospital and that person lives about two hours from me and the hospital was is an additional hour on top of that when i brought them back to canada so that was probably the most harrowing that i've ever had to experience i could see you light up like this is something that you feel like i don't know if you were made to do it or you really like it and if you really like it it shows <laughs> for somebody who is considering this as a career path what maybe um, behind the curtain would you want them to know that maybe isn't so wonderful about this position? Because giving birth and new life miracle, yes, we get it. But tell us ab about some of the, the real nitty gritty that goes on in this position. It is something I think I was born to do. I came home from my first birth as a doula and said, this is what I'm supposed to do with the rest of my life, help people have babies. And my partner at the time looked at me and said, how do you know that? And I just said, I don't, I don't know, I just know. Since then, though, you're right. There have been things that people don't necessarily talk about or you don't necessarily think about when you've got your rose colored glasses on. I've missed Christmases, birthdays, important celebrations. Um, I've had to cut short family trips. I've had, uh, you know, and I've talked to my grown adult children now about the things that I've missed. And they, they always have said that they love that that's what I do because they think it's really cool. And, you know, they, they always know that they can ask me kind of any questions about sex, reproduction, all of it, because they figure I'll have an answer of some kind for them. So they think it's neat, but, but they do talk about missing me at different times in their life when I just haven't been able to go and do stuff with them. Um, I've, I've run on fumes. I mean, it's, it's exhausting work to <laughs> come out of some of them and think, well, that's, that's more than a workout. Um, mm -hmm. I, how many times I've spent the next three days icing my pecs because I've spent hours doing a double hip squeeze for somebody. The remuneration in cases like that is not necessarily fantastic. You don't do, you, you don't become a doula to get rich. It's not a get rich process it's something you have to do as a passion because you, and you probably have to supplement that with something else because it doesn't necessarily always pay the bills um, and when it's bad it doesn't get worse my job has been the best thing on the planet hands down bar and none there's no job better when it's good but when right. it's bad there isn't a, 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 there isn't anything worse in the world that's quite a spectrum <laughs> um, so just generally, um, if somebody were looking to get into this, what could they expect as a beginning um, annual salary or income to maybe some of the mm -hmm. highest that you've seen? That really depends on where they live because, because mm -hmm. so much of it is based on demographics. 
So I know a lot of people who do it really on a, an, an extreme sliding scale because they want the people that need the support to have the support and really just to be remunerated for their parking fees and their babysitting costs and maybe food while they're while they're attending and other people who are charging two thousand dollars a birth and if they're doing three or four births a month that adds up pretty quickly in all of your experience thinking back and all of the people you've worked with with the mothers and everybody who is involved what do you wish is one thing that they would have asked you or you would want them to know about what it is that you do um, I think more than anything, I want them to know that what I do is something that I do because I truly love it. And, and my interests are not at the forefront. And I think that that's something that's evolved over time, truthfully. I think when I first got into working in this capacity, I'd had a really yucky birth myself the first time. I felt like I didn't have any opportunities to make decisions for myself, that other people were making those choices for me. So I wanted them, I, so I would want people to know that I'm there with information. I am willing to share it with them. I will help them have the voice they need to have in order to have the experience that they want to have. Um, because I think that then I went from my first, my birth experience to them thinking everybody probably wants to have, you know, a, a, an unmedicated birth and all of these intervention free and everything else. And then I realized that's, that's my story. That's not, not everybody else's story. And so I, I've evolved to realize that. And I've, and I've dropped my expectations down to understand that my best story isn't everyone else's best story, but they deserve to experience whatever their best story is for them. Okay, so that leads me to think that there are so many dots on the spectrum of how to deliver. What different variations like what, what are the different variations? If you can just on a high level, give us some. Sure. So there are, um, I know many people who've had completely unmedicated births. They went into labor on their own. They labored on their own at home. The midwife came in and they just got into a position that felt comfortable for them, whether they were laying down on their back, on their side, whether they were squatting, whether they were um, on the, in the hands or knees, and they just pushed out a baby and birthed a baby. And then you have people who are induced and have to have their labor started artificially. Um, some of those people choose to have a medicated labor because an induced labor is different physiologically. It makes you feel different than an unmedicated labor does uh, or an uninduced labor does. So you may need some extra support, medical support to help with that. So you feel like you have the coping strategies to continue moving forward. Some babies need to be assisted with delivery in terms of vacuum or forceps. Um, sometimes someone needs to have an episiotomy, which is a, a cut to the entrance of the vaginal path to make the birth canal bigger, um, to facilitate birthing a baby. Other people choose to have a, a cesarean, right? So in the moment they find out that they're expecting a baby, they want to have a scheduled cesarean section where that baby is birthed surgically. They come in at a specified date and time and they have their baby and other people end up with an emergency cesarean along the way for whatever reason. Have you, or would you like to take me uh, through a scenario where everything was set up as planned and things took a turn? Um, but I've had lots and both, both kinds. I had, uh, I had a client of mine who um, it was her second baby with me. The first baby went like clockwork. She uh, knew when her baby was due. She was 41 weeks. She was induced. They induced using a synthetic prostaglandin. So her body went into labor a little bit more gradually than it would have if they'd used synthetic oxytocin. And labor kind of moved along beautifully. And she got to a point where she was ready to have a medicated birth. And that went smoothly. And her baby was born a couple of hours later. And then she was pregnant with her second child and went into labor on her own and thought, well, but okay, now I've gone into labor on my own. How do, when do I know to get the medication? And I said, well, we'll still watch how the contractions move forward. And they moved gradually forward. But all of a sudden, once she got to about five or six centimeters dilated and really at a time where it was perfect, we were getting to the hospital, we we're gonna ask for an epidural. And then all of a sudden she had um, her baby because things moved along really quickly. And she 
for quite a long time felt really resentful that she didn't get to have an epidural and the medicated birth she wanted to have. So we, we sort of assume that if people get to have a baby and not have to have an epidural, that that must be a good thing. But for some people, they really, truly want to have that picture that they've put in their own minds. And it can be whatever they want it to be. That's the best thing about setting yourself up for labor. We, we do everything we can to try and get you emotionally as ready as you can possibly be to, to have the birth that you have always dreamed about. But I always call them birth wish lists instead of a plan because at the end of the day, we can't plan birth. We can just hope for what we hope for and then steer ourselves in the direction to increase the likelihood that it'll work out the way we want. Yeah, you mentioned earlier about um, working on fumes or uh, things like that. So what can someone in your position do to um, train or kind of get yourself ready? Um, what do you advise? I try to remind people to make sure that they pack protein snacks for themselves to give themselves the energy that they need to go on. It's quick and easy to throw a couple of granola bars or something in the in the bag and take that with you, but you really need good protein snacks to give you the sustained energy you need to be able to, to have the endurance to do a birth. Um, lots of hydration. Again, we, we kind of think, okay, we're getting tired. Let's run on, grab ourselves a coffee and come back in. And at the end of the day, we need better hydration than that, more water and, and things like that. So um, those kinds of things are the types of things that I would say, I get as much rest beforehand as you possibly can. So when you know that your client is due in two to three weeks, make sure that you're not burning the candle at both ends. You're getting an adequate amount of rest uh, so that if you have to go a day or so without any sleep or with very little sleep, you, you can keep that going. If somebody uh, came to you and asked you for advice about getting into this line of work, what would you tell them? I would tell them to have a long, hard chat with themselves as well as their partner if they have one to make sure that their partner is fully on board. I have seen relationships break down because of just the expectation that there would be a different role played in the family dynamic um, and, and, and being a dualist, depending on how many clients you take at a time, um, it can put it can put a lot of extra strain on a relationship, especially if one individual is traveling a lot for work, you've got small children, and then if somebody decides that they're going to be a doula, it's a fantastic profession, but what are you going to do at three o'clock in the morning? Who are you going to call? Have you got your network sort of put in place before you even take mm -hmm. those steps to get the training? Um, then do um, the reading and see if you can attend a birth or two before you go through that process to really experience it. Do a volunteer birth or two. See if it truly does fit you. you you want it's the kind of work that has to be something that you're truly deeply passionate about um, and not just something that you're doing because it sounds neat uh, because it, it takes an it takes an emotional toll every single birth I've been to I I can conjure back in my mind because they have just had some kind of an impact on my life thank you for that and then to maybe look at what their demographic I don't know, and requirements are mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. that state or yeah. and support. Um, yeah. It seems like there's a lot that goes into this because it's not a nine to five. <laughs> no, it's not a nine to five. Well, not a nine to five in the same day. It may be a nine to five, but that may be over the course of a couple of days. So and find out what their local we, hospitals think about it too. How welcoming are their local facilities at to receiving doulas coming in to work there? If you want to mm -hmm. work in an environment that's welcoming as well so that you because the fear is if a hospital doesn't really like doulas then how is your client going to be treated if they come in with a doula in tow we are wrapping up here but can you tell us uh about baby ready that info and where we can reach you and or see more of you on social media any kind of information you want to give us um, I can be found on TikTok. It's Baby Ready LGBTQ. I post content about signs and symptoms of labor and coping with labor and parenting small children and all kinds of stuff. And truthfully, if somebody is thinking about um, having a baby, that's a great resource for them. Um, 
babyready.info offers all kinds of different packages, whether we're talking about fertility, whether we're talking about DEI initiatives, whether we're talking about parenting, there's all kinds of stuff on my website, uh, babyready.info. I'm on Instagram, babyready, uh, LGBTQ as well. And I post similar stuff there as I do with TikTok. Sam, this has been a very <laughs> interesting conversation. I want to thank you for your time and, and sharing your expertise and being able to line out. I didn't even have to ask as many questions because you just lined out everything that I needed to know. But um, thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks so much for listening. If you have a job you want to learn more about, let me know and I'll create an episode for you. Contact me at hello at workuniversity.org. You can also get new episode announcements when you follow me on Instagram at work.university.